Okay, welcome to class number three of Introduction to Derivatives. And in this class, we're going to learn about option pricing. So, so far, we've learned what derivatives are. We've learned about futures and forwards. And we've learned about options and how people trade them. But obviously, a very important point here that we need to work out is how do people price options? How do you work out when given a price on a call or a put option, whether that is a fair price or whether it's too expensive or maybe even too cheap? So this week, we're going to be looking at chapters five through seven of your textbooks. And once again, do read the chapters in order to keep up with what's going on. So the first thing we're going to talk about is options pricing history. And options have been around for a very long time. And people have traded option-like agreements. They've entered into these types of agreements for hundreds of years. But up until quite recently, there were no mathematical models for pricing options. It's really only in the 1970s that the models that we use today were developed. And options actually were traded on exchanges before these models were developed, and people really just used their instincts. A lot of the traders who were trading in options had been trading stocks for a long time. They traded options, and they they sort of iteratively worked out what a fair price was based on whether they were going bust or not, uh, based upon their trading. And so there was a certain intuition to when something was too expensive or too cheap, and people learned from their mistakes. But that really meant that it was a very niche, specialized business because you couldn't quickly teach someone about options the way we're learning in this class, simply because there was no formal method for understanding what goes into the price of an option. And so the models that we're talking about are all fairly recent. So let's think about it from the very beginning. We know, as you can see on this slide, we've got these payoff diagrams that you've looked at in previous classes. And we know the value of options at maturity. And that's very easy to work out. It's basically the relationship between the strike price and the spot price at expiration and whether you get a payoff or not. As you can see on our next slide, we also know that options are worth more for maturity, and that's because of time value. So the, the light blue line we've got in there labeled option value pre-maturity is an, an obvious thing that it's worth more. And as we move closer and closer to maturity, that line is going to move in and in. And at expiration, we'll have the payoff diagram, just like we saw on the last slide. So we just really need to work out how much more than intrinsic value is an option worth before it matures. OK, so the next thing we're going to look at is the binomial tree approach to pricing options. Now, there are two binomial tree approaches. There's two methods. They both turn out to be mathematically the same, but they're just different ways of doing the same calculation. And some people like one way, other people like another way. So we'll look at both of them. The first method is referred to as the portfolio method, or often people refer to it as the delta method of calculating a binomial tree. The first step is to draw the tree. It's to draw a diagram of possible price paths for the underlying over the option's life. And then all we need to do is calculate the present value of the probability weighted cash flows to determine the option's current fair value. OK, so there's one assumption that we need to take into account to begin with on this, and that is that we have to assume that there are no arbitrages freely available in the marketplace. And then if we know with 100% certainty that there are only two outcomes for the stock price at T, the expiration date, we can then calculate the fair value for an option. Now, obviously, this seems like quite a big assumption here that we're talking about, that we know with certainty that there are only two possible outcomes for a stock price, because in the real world, such an assumption seems ludicrous. But what we're doing here with our binomial tree approaches, both in this approach and in the next approach that we'll learn in a few minutes, is we're starting with a very simple 
binomial tree, a one-step binomial tree that makes rather large and maybe slightly ridiculous assumptions. But then as we move along, we'll make much more realistic assumptions. So don't worry at the moment if you find this difficult to believe and questionable, because it is at this point, but when we get to the end of this class, hopefully you'll see that we've come up with a reasonable real world approach to pricing options. The first binomial tree we're going to build is to price an option. We're going to suppose that the spot price is at 50, that the price of the underlying is at 50, and that we know at the end of one month that it will either be at $70 or $30. Then what we're going to do is price a European call option where the strike price is 50, so it's an at-the-money call option, where there's one month till expiration and where the risk-free rate of return is 5%. The first step is simply to draw our tree, and it's a single-step tree, so we just draw the little diagram like you see on your screen, and we write in the information that we know. So we know that the spot price, the price of the underlying, is at $50 right now. We know that in the upside economic scenario, that the price of the underlying will be at $70 at expiration. And we know that in the downside economic scenario, that the spot price will be at $30 at expiration. So then all we have to do is put in what our call option would be worth. Now, it's a call option with a strike price of 50. So when the underlying is at 70, if you own a contract that allows you to buy it at 50, that contract is clearly worth $20. $70 minus 50 gives us $20. Equally, in the downside economic scenario, that contract is worthless. So we write in for our upside scenario, C equals 20. And in the downside scenario, we write in C equals zero. So now you've written down all of the stuff that we've got on our slide right now. So now we have to think about the theory of this approach. So if we could set up a portfolio of the underlying S and the derivative C, because it's a call option, on that same underlying, where there is no uncertainty about the valuations at maturity, time T, the portfolio will be made up of some amount, delta, of S, of the underlying, and short one call option. So we're long some amount of stock, and we're short one call option. So our portfolio equals delta, multiplied by S minus C. Now, I'll pause at this moment to explain why we're short a call option, why we're long the spot and short the call option, because often students get confused at this point. The reason is that one must hedge the other, because we're looking to find a portfolio where there's some amount delta times S and the call option, where both things are in the portfolio, the option and the underlying, where at both the upside and the downside economic scenario, they have the exact same value. So we know that if the underlying goes up in value, that the call will go up in value. And we know that if the underlying falls in value, that the call will fall in value. So they have to have opposite signs in order for it to make sense within a portfolio because one must hedge the other. So when we're long one and short the other, we know that if the underlying goes up, that the minus call will be going down. And if the underlying is going down, that the minus call will be going up. And so when we're long one and short the other, we're hedged and we should hopefully be able to find a balancing point where both portfolios are equal. Okay, so let's move on to our next slide. If our portfolio equals delta times S minus C, we can then just sub those numbers into our little diagram that we've drawn already. So 70, which is the value of the underlying in the upside scenario, multiplied by delta minus 20 will be our portfolio in the upside. And 30 multiplied by delta minus zero will be our portfolio in the downside economic scenario. Then you can see on the next slide that all we have to do is solve for delta where 
both portfolios are equivalent. So we set the two ending portfolios as equal. Delta times 70 minus 20 equals delta times 30. And then we solve for delta. We try and see, is there a value for delta that will allow those two portfolios to be equal? And as you can see there, if we solve for delta, we get 0.5. So 0.5 times 70 gives us 35, minus 20 gives us 15, and then 0.5 times 30 gives us 15. So if we had a portfolio where we had half of a share of stock and we're short one call option, no matter what happens in this world in which there are only two possible outcomes, our portfolio would be worth the same thing in each economic scenario. Now, if we move on to the next slide, you can see that a portfolio can be considered riskless if it's worth the same in either economic scenario, right? Because in a good economic scenario, you have $15. In a bad economic scenario, you still have $15. So you have a riskless portfolio, a portfolio that is worth the same in all economic outcomes. And we've said one of our assumptions is that we do know that there are no possible outcomes other than that the stock moves to either 70 or 30. And so we know that in all economic scenarios, our portfolio is worth 15. And thus we have a riskless portfolio. So let's think about that. What interest rate should we discount a riskless portfolio at? And the answer is, of course, the risk-free rate. So if we discount our portfolio of delta times S minus C at the risk-free rate, we then know what the value of that risk-free portfolio is today. And so delta times S minus C is equal to $15 e to the RT, which is e to the minus 0.05 times 1 over 12, and that's 1 over 12 because it's one month out of the year. That then tells us the value of delta S minus C. Now we need to just see what C is worth, so we need to remove delta times S from that. And we know that the stock at inception is trading at $50, so 0.5 times $50 gives us $25. If we strip that $25 out, we can now see that our call option is worth $10.06. So that is the delta or the portfolio approach to pricing an option using a binomial tree. And on your next slide, you can see the generalized binomial valuation and how that works. And so what's interesting there is that what we're doing is that we're pricing our option in terms of the price of the underlying. We're saying that if the underlying is worth this amount, then the option has to be worth this other amount based on this no arbitrage assumption. The no arbitrage assumption probably seems reasonable enough to you. It's just this problem of how do we know that the underlying could possibly be worth either 70 or 30 and no possible other values in a month's time. And obviously we can't know that, but if we were to scale this down and down to smaller and smaller time frames, it starts to look an awful lot more reasonable. So it might be extremely unlikely to claim that we know the two possible price points in a month's time. But if we moved it down to the microsecond level, it's probably quite reasonable to claim that the stock might only be able to move a certain amount over that very short time frame. So really, in order to make this calculation seem more valid, what we need to do is see if we can move it from this very long stretch of time to a much shorter stretch of time where the assumptions don't seem quite so outrageous. So that is the delta or the portfolio approach to binomial tree valuation. The next model that we're going to look at is the risk neutral valuation approach. And these two approaches are mathematically identical. And for those of you who are really interested in this or quite adept at mathematics, do look at the chapter in your book and it will explain how the two approaches to binomial valuation relate to each other. We're going to move along now 
But I'll ask you to keep that idea of delta of some amount of stock in your head for the next few classes because delta is going to show up again. So the next approach that we're going to look at is the risk neutral valuation approach to building binomial trees. So this is another binomial tree approach, but the calculations are a little bit different. Now, as I just mentioned, they will give you the same results, but many people prefer this approach to calculation. The real reason we looked at the last example was it shows you that delta calculation and you get to understand the logic beneath what we're doing. Okay, so let's look at the next method. Basically, it involves drawing a lattice or a tree in which we write down possible price paths for the underlying over the life. We then work out the probability of those price points being hit. And then we present value the probability weighted cash flows to determine the options current fair market value. So that's, that's the theory underlying the binomial tree options valuation approach. So our next slide here shows merchant ship insurance outcomes. It's, it, the idea of this is that we're going to see how an insurance policy might be priced because an option is an awful lot like an insurance policy. If you remember in our last class when we talked about the idea of a protective put, if you own a stock and you buy a put on it, it's like buying an insurance policy on it. If the price falls, you get to get your money back like with an insurance policy because you get to make someone buy it from you at a higher price than it's trading at today. So if we think about how insurance works, and we've got ships here as an example, just because that was one of the earlier forms of insurance. And if you were writing insurance on shipping, there's two things that can happen. All can go well, and you've just received your premium. You've received your insurance premium, and you pay nothing out to the insured party. Or if something goes wrong, like the ship sinking, you have to pay the merchant an amount of money to make him even. So in our example, we've got here £10,000. Now, if we were to try and price this insurance policy, we would say, well, what's the chance of the ship sinking? And we'll say, just to take a round number, we'll say if there's a 1% chance of that ship sinking, we would then multiply 1% times the amount of money we have to pay out. And that would give us, in this example, £100. And 99% times the amount that we pay out if nothing goes wrong, and that's 99 times zero, so that's zero. So then what we would do is we would present value those two outcomes. So whatever the present value of a hundred pounds is would be the fair price of writing that insurance policy. Now, obviously, if you're going to write that insurance policy, you're probably going to want to charge more than a hundred pounds because if you're selling it at fair value every time, you never earn a profit. You'll just keep uh, hopefully getting your money back. So. That, that is how you might price a very simple insurance policy. So let's move on to the next slide and try and apply some of that to the idea of trying to price an option. So we've got a, an example here of an option where the underlying is trading at $50, S0, the spot price is 50. And we know that in one month, the underlying will either be at 70 or 30. And we're asked to value an at the money European call option. So the strike price is 50. The expiration is in one month's time and the risk free rate is 5%. So we can draw a little diagram just like we did for the insurance outcome. And we know that if, if there's only in this example, there's only two possible outcomes. Nothing else can happen other than the price either goes to 70 or it goes to 30. So if the price went to 70 at expiration, our call would be worth the difference 
between the price at expiration and the strike price of the option. So that's 70 minus 50 gives us 20. So we've got there C equals 20. That's the value of the call in the upside economic scenario. In the downside economic scenario, the call is worth nothing because the underlying is at 30. So you would allow that to expire worthless if, if you own that call option. So we've got now a little diagram, a little bit like our insurance diagram. So now we just need to add more color to it and see if we can if we can price up our option. So the next slide here, we're just looking at notation and it's important to know this notation um, so we can understand the formulas we're about to look at. So S0 is the spot price, the, the price of the underlying right now, which is time zero. F is the options value. FU is the options value at the up node, so U for up. And FD is the options value at the down node, D for down. And then S0D is the underlying price at the down node, and S0U is the price of the underlying at the up node. So that's our notation. Now, a lot of people, when they look at examples like this, they say, well, what about the stock's expected return? Like if there's a good stock, if there's a bad stock, you know, th their options should be priced quite differently. And I'll explain more on that in, in a few minutes, but it doesn't actually matter at the moment. The reason that it doesn't matter is we're going to be pricing our option in terms of the price of the underlying. So we're going to say that given that the stock is worth this, an option's fair value is that. And um, all of the things like whether the stock is a good or a bad stock, we feel is encapsulated in the price of the stock, you know, and all of the risks of the stock are encapsulated in the price of the stock. So we're really just pricing our option, assuming that the value of the stock is is fair. So our next slide here shows our formula. So our formula F, the value of the derivative, is equal to e to the RT, so the present value of, and then in brackets, P times FU. P is the risk neutral probability of an up move times FU, which is the value of the derivative at the up node, plus 1 minus P, which is the probability, the risk neutral probability of a down move, times FD, which is the, the value of the derivative or the payout of the derivative at the down node, where P, um, which is our risk neutral probability, is equal to E to the RT, so present valuing, minus D, which is the, the amount it moves down over U minus D, which is over up minus down, the amount it moves up and the amount it moves down. So let's take our example and put it into that formula. So we said that the stock's at 50 right now. It can go up to 70 or down to 30. It can't go to any other prices. And in the up node, the call option will be worth 20. Now, how do we work out our risk neutral probabilities, our probability of up and probability of a down move? Well, let's run our numbers through our formula. So the amount it can move up, if we take 70 and put it over 50, so 70 divided by 50 gives us 1.4 and 30 over 50 gives us 0 0.6. So it can move up 50 times 1.4 to 70, or it can move down 50 times 0.6 to 30. So we sub that into our formula along with the interest rate and the amount of time. So P equals E to the 0 0.05, that's our 5% interest rate, times 1 over 12, that's because there's 12 months in a year, and we are looking at one month, there's a one month expiration on this option, minus 0 0.6, which is D over 1.4, which is U, minus 0 0.6, which is D. And that gives us 0 0.5052, and that is P, the risk neutral probability of an up move. So once we have that, we can now move on to our main formula. So F, the value of the derivative, is equal to E to the RT, the present value of P, which we just calculated, 
uh, which was 0.5052 times 20, the value of the derivative at the up node, and then 1 minus p, which is 0.4948 times 0. So anything multiplied by 0 is worth 0. So we can leave that out. And we now know that it, the value of our derivative is the present value of 0.5052 times 20. So the value of our derivative turns out in this case to be $10.06. So that's our formula. And so far, it's, it's not hugely realistic, but we'll get there. Don't worry. Um, so risk neutral valuation on our next slide is an important principle in derivatives valuation that we're in a risk neutral world. And it's a simplification that works for valuation purposes, but it only works when all of the instruments included in the valuation depend on the same underlying. So, Investors' risk preferences don't affect the options price because we're pricing the option in terms of the underlying stock. So it's like if you had two bottles of milk, a liter bottle of milk and a half liter bottle of milk. And if you were told the price of one, you can interpolate the price of the other. And if someone said, well, you know, what about and gave you a, a list of questions about it, your answer would be, well, the value of the one I'm estimating is fair, assuming the value of the other one is fair. So we're pricing our option in terms of the underlying stock and the formula relating option prices to the underlying should make sense. So the next thing is how do we make this more realistic? One of our problems is that there's only two likely outcomes that an underlying either goes to 70 or 30. And that seems quite unrealistic. So how can we make that more realistic? Well, we move here on the next slide. You can see a two-step binomial tree. So now once we add an extra step, we now have three possible outcomes. And of course, we can add more and more steps, getting more and more possible outcomes which will make this more realistic. Now, the formulas for calculating the value, the price of the option using a two-step binomial tree is essentially the same as the formula for the one-step tree. But what we do is we solve, um, if you look at the slide here, what we're solving for to begin with is FU and FD. And we're, we're, we're using our formula, the same formula we used the last time, to solve those two entries that then gives us FU and FD, and then we solve for F. So we basically run the numbers through the same formula three times in order to solve this two-step binomial tree. So let's, uh, let's look at that. On the next uh, slide, we've got the formulas, and as you can see, they're the same. So to, to work out what FU and FD are, it's E to the R, T2 minus T1. So that's the amount of time per step. So we'll say, for example, on the last one, we had a one month tree or a one month expiration option. If we were trying to price that using a two step rather than a one step binomial tree, we would just take the time and divide it by two and, and imagine that half of the time is spent in the first part of the tree and half of the time is spent on the second part of the tree. So as you can see there, the formula is the same formula as we used earlier on, except that we have this T2 minus T1, and we're looking at FUU and FDU. We're looking at the, the, the value of the derivative at the very end of the tree and working our way back, where P equals E to the R T2 minus T1 minus D over U minus D. So essentially the same formula, but we're taking the time and breaking it up. And so that is, that's our formula for doing a two-step binomial tree. So we'll look at an example here. Um, we can use binomial trees for valuing puts or calls. We're going to look at a put this time, just to, to be different to the last time. In our example here, we're going to be looking at a two-step binomial tree where each step is one year long. So our option expires in two years, and each step on the tree will thus be one year long. Um, at each node, the stock price can either move up or move down by 20%. 
The risk-free rate is 5%. The underlying right now is trading at 20, so the spot is 20. And we need to value a European put option with a strike price of $20, so an at-the-money put option. So let's see how we do this. The first step is simply to draw your tree. Um, so we draw the heavy black lines that you can see there on the diagram, and we write in the information that we know. So at the moment, we don't know an awful lot, but we do know that the spot price, the price right now, is at 20. So on the left-hand side, there you see S0 equals 20. So we write that down. Then we need to see, well, what will the price of the underlying B at the various nodes. So we know it can move up 20% or down 20% at each node. So 20 multiplied by 1.2 or up 20% equals 24. So we write 24 at the next node up. And then we calculate the down node. So 20 multiplied by 0.8, which is 20% lower, gives us $16. So we write 16 at that lower node. Then we need to look at the, the very top node, the up, up node. And so we just take our 24 from our last calculation and multiply that by 1.2 again. And that gives us 28.8. We take our 24 and we multiply it by 0.8. And that gives us 19.2. Now, alternately, you could have taken your 16 and multiplied it by 1.2, and that'll give you the same price, 19.2. So the, the, the two uh, points meet there in the middle. And then finally, we need to, to calculate the down, down node. So we take our $16 that we calculated, and we multiply that by 0.8. And that gives us 12.8. So now we know that at expiration in two years time, the underlying will either stop at 28.8, 19.2, or 12.8. So that's good. Now we need to see how our put will pay off in those situations. Now, a put is the right, but not the obligation to, to sell the stock at the strike price, which was 20. Now, if the market is at 28.8, we're not going to want to sell it at 20. We're going to let that put expire worthless. So the value of our derivative at the up, up node is equal to zero. So we've written in there FUU equals zero. Now, the, at 19.2, which is the middle node, we have the right, but not the obligation, to sell the underlying at 20. Now, obviously, that's worth some money because the underlying is now below our strike price of 20. And so the difference between 20 and 19.2 is 80 cents. So at that middle node, our derivative is worth 80 cents. So FUD equals 0.8. And then finally, at the bottom node, uh, when the underlying has fallen to 12.8, we take 20 minus 12.8, and that gives us the value of our derivative at the down node as 7.2. So we've filled out our binomial tree right now, and let's look at the next slide. We need to calculate P. So P equals E to the 0 0.05. We don't need to put any time in there because we, we've decided in this case that each node is one year long. So we don't put, you know, 12 over 12. You, you know, we, we just go e to 0 0.05 minus 0 0.8. And that, that is the down, the amount it can move down, down 20% is 0 0.8. So over 1.2 minus 0 0.8, so over, up, minus, down. And that gives us 0 0.6282, so that is our P calculation. At this point, then, we can run all of our numbers through the formulas, and we see here the P calculation that we've just done, and then we price FU, we price FD, both using the formulas that we've used earlier. So we can see that FU is worth 28 cents. FD is $3.02. We then take the formula, do it one more time, this time subbing in our 28 cents and our $3.02. And we calculate that the derivative is worth $1.24. 
So that's a, a two-step binomial tree. It's not really any more complicated than the one step, except that there's we have to do the calculation three times rather than one time. So now we've used firstly a one-step binomial tree to value a call option. We've then used a two-step binomial tree to value a put option. And as you can see, it's not an awfully complicated thing. There's, there's a couple of fairly simple formulas and we punch in the numbers and we get our values. So that's binomial trees. The next thing we're going to look at is American options because American style options, as you probably remember from last week, um, is an option that can be exercised pre-maturity at the owner's discretion. And a binomial tree can value American options. And there's just a small change that we have to make to our approach in order to do that. And that is that we evaluated each node if there's more value associated with exercising the option or holding it to expiration. So let's take a look at an example here. In this example here, we've got the American put. It's the same one as last time. We've got the spot at 20. It can go up or down 20% at each node. It's a two-year expiration option. Everything is the same. And so we fill out our binomial tree in the exact same manner. And we end up with the up-up node at 288 the up-down node at 19.2, and the down-down node at 12.8. And once again, then the payoffs of the derivative are 0, 0 0.8, and 7.2. So everything is the same as the last time. We then do our calculations, and we calculate what fu is. So we run our numbers through the formula, and we calculate fu as 28 cents, just like the last time. We then calculate FD, and we calculate that as being $3.02, just like the last time. But at this point, we take a pause, and we evaluate whether that value is higher or lower than the, the value you would get if you early exercise. So we know that at this down node, that the underlying is at $16. Now, the strike price of the option was 20. So if we exercised it right now, 20 minus 16 is $4. We'd get $4. So we know that early exercise would get us $4. Our calculated value here is $3.02, which can't be right for an American option. So what we do is we just simply cross out the $3.02 we sub in $4, which is the amount you would get from early exercise, and then we move on with our formula. So once again, we run everything through our formula, and we find that this derivative is calculated to be now worth $1.58. Now, we can at this point as well evaluate whether it would be better or not to early exercise. Now, at this node, at the starting node, the spot price is 20 and the strike price of the option is 20. So you wouldn't get any money for early exercising at that point. So a dollar and 58 cents thus is the fair value of this American put option. So that's all you have to do to calculate an American option rather than a European option. It's a very simple change to the formula. The price difference, so we priced the same put. We firstly priced it as a European put and found it was worth $1.24. We then priced it as an American put and found that it was worth $1.58. So we're able to now see, as we mentioned last week, that American options are worth more than European options. And in this example, an American option is worth $0.34 cents more than an identical European option. So that is that is how we price an American option using the binomial tree method. So the next thing we're going to look at is dividends, because what if our stock plays a dividend? So what we'll do now is we'll look at an example of an American call option that pays a $2.50 dividend one day 
before expiration. And the reason we've got this dividend coming in one day before expiration is to minimize the sort of present value in differences that would have to occur. So here's our option. The spot right now is at 30. The strike price of our call option is also 30. So it's an at the money call option. U is 1.1. D is 0 0.9. There's two years to expiration and the risk free rate is 5%. So we do the same thing we did the last time. We draw our three. We write in that the spot price is 30. We calculate that it, at the first note, it can go up to 33 and then up to 36. The middle node is 29.7, which is 30 times 1.1 uh, times 0 0.9. And then it can go down to 27 and then down, down to 24.3. So we do all of that just like we did the last time. But then what we have to do is take out the dividend because we know that the underlying will fall by the amount of the dividend, which occurs basically right at expiration. So we take our 36.3, subtract $2.50, and that gives us 33.8. From the 29.7 minus 250, we get 27.2. And 24.30 minus $2.50 gives us $21.80. So those are now our ending prices. After that, we take the same approach as we did before. We work out what our derivative is worth at the up-up node. That turns out to be $3.80. At the UD node, it's zero. And at the DD node, it's zero. We then run these numbers through our formulas. And we see that at U, the calculated value is $2.73. Now we then stop and think, well, the underlying is at 33. The strike price was 30. So this is a call option. We could exercise it early and get $3. So we simply cross out our $2.73 and sub in $3. Now, at the down note, the calculated value is zero. And equally, the early exercise value is zero because the option is out of the money when it's at, when the underlying is at 27. So that's fine. And then we calculate the, we run all of these numbers through our formula once more, and we calculate that the option is worth $2.16. So that's how we include a dividend in our binomial tree. So that's really all there is to it. And as you can see, the binomial tree approach is quite flexible in that we're able to adjust for all sorts of things within its structure. Now, the next slide we have here is of a large binomial tree. Now, obviously, you don't calculate all of these things by hand with a calculator and formulas, and you can program these into either you can write a piece of code to calculate the value, or you can even use Excel if you wanted to. And you can put in as many steps in the binomial tree as you wish to. And the more steps that you put in, the more realistic it becomes, because what we have here is essentially something that's starting to look like a normal distribution of the stock price, where there are many paths that lead towards the middle and not very many paths that lead towards the edges of that large binomial tree. And thus, you come up with an increasingly realistic approach to pricing options as the time periods between the nodes become smaller and smaller. And with computing power, you can really make the node the length quite small. So that is binomial trees. The one thing we haven't talked about so far is U and D. We've said that we know that the stock price can go up a certain amount or down a certain amount, but we haven't really explained where we get U and D from. And where we get that from is actually just from volatility. So we've got a formula here. U is equal to E 
to the sigma times the square root of time. And what that is telling us is that we're able to calculate u just given the volatility of the underlying. And that tells us that all we really need in order to price an option is the details of the option, the price of the underlying, the volatility, the standard deviation of the underlying, and the risk-free rate. So U and D are not made up numbers where we're saying, well, it can go up 10% or down 10%. In fact, they just relate to how volatile the underlying is. And that also then shows you how, when we talked about uh, volatility last week, how a more volatile option is going to be more expensive than a less volatile option. So that's binomial trees. Okay, so now we're going to move on to our next model for pricing options, and that is the Black-Scholes-Merton model. We often refer to as the Black-Scholes model uh, for pricing options, and it's probably one of the most famous mathematical models in finance. And it was a formula that won Nobel Prizes for its uh, creators. So there are some assumptions about stock price behavior that are required for the Black-Scholes model. The first one is that the underlying asset price follows geometric Brownian motion, and that the price is log-normally distributed and cannot jump. So these are important assumptions to know about. Then on the actual models assumptions, we have that the stock price follows geometric Brownian motion with a constant mu, our expected return, and sigma volatility. We assume that securities can be sold short and that the proceeds can be used in full. We assume that there are no taxes and no trading costs and that all securities are perfectly divisible. We assume that there are no dividends on the underlying over the life of the option. We assume that there are no arbitrage opportunities available in markets. We assume that trading is continuous, that there's no overnight market closures, and that there's no real gappiness in the price of the underlying. And we assume that borrowing and lending occur at the same rate R. And so those are the assumptions, and they are all required in order for this model to work. So the no arbitrage argument underlying this is that if you use a portfolio that is delta times stock, so some amount of stock and some amount of options, that it can be riskless, much like with our binomial trees. And if we take the time period of each riskless portfolio down to being instantaneous and assume that you can continuously rebalance in order to maintain a riskless portfolio, that the expected cash flows at the end of each period can be discounted at R, that then we're able to price options perfectly. So on our next slide, we have the Black-Scholes model, and it prices European calls and European puts. And so there's two different formulas for, uh, there's a different formula for calls and puts, or you could just calculate one of them and use put call parity to price the other. But our formula for a European call is S0, so the spot price, times N of D1 minus K, which is the strike price, times a present valuing factor times N of D2 is equal to the value of a European call option, or for a European put option, it equals K, which is the strike price, times E to the RT, times N of D2, minus the spot, times N of D1. And then we have to calculate D1 and D2. So D1 is the log of the spot over the strike, plus R, the risk-free rate, plus sigma, which is the volatility squared, over 2 times t, all divided by sigma, which is the volatility, times the square root of time. d2 is the log of the spot over the strike, plus the risk-free rate, minus sigma squared over 2, times t, the length of time to expiration, 
divided by sigma times the square root of time. And so that is d1 and d2. And then n is the cumulative probability function for a standardized normal variable. And so I have that formula on the next slide. And in Excel, if you want to calculate this, you can use the function equals norm dist. And that calculates n of whatever you need it to calculate. So interpretations of the Black-Scholes formula. The Black-Scholes formula is a beautiful piece of calculus that really just, it's doing the same calculation that we were doing in our binomial tree approach, but instead of it being in discrete time, which is short periods of time, it moves it to continuous time. Now, in order to do that, it does require a number of additional assumptions that we didn't really require with the binomial tree approach. But both of these formulas calculate very similar prices for options. The Black-Scholes model tells us that we can perfectly price European-style options as long as the underlying moves in a Brownian motion-like manner with a certain drift and a stationary volatility. Now, in the real world, this is not 100% perfect because that's not exactly how stock prices move, and some of the assumptions are not perfectly accurate. But it's really quite good. It gives us a very reasonable price for an option. And it gives us an ability to compare the prices of various options to each other. Now, like any model, it is a simplification of a complex system. But it is such a good model that since it was developed, it's in continuous use. Almost every options trader that is out there is using the Black-Scholes model to price options and to compare the prices of different options to each other. And really, any of the newer models that have come up since the Black-Scholes model just tend to be modifications. They use the the core calculation of the Black-Scholes model and simply extend it in order to increase the flexibility of the model. Now, one parameter that we've seen in the Black-Scholes model is volatility, and volatility is a hugely important number in order to perfectly price options. And we, we used volatility earlier in our binomial tree approach as well. Now, what volatility do we use is the question. And there's, there's many ways of calculating the standard deviation. Um, you could look at one year's worth of data. You could look at a month's worth of data. You could look at 30 years worth of data and you will come out with all different volatilities. These are historic volatilities. This is the volatility that the underlying has been moving at. Now the implied volatility that we're talking about in pricing options is actually a forward-looking volatility. So it only perfectly prices the option if you know what volatility is. And of course, we don't actually, we don't know how volatility a stock or a market will be over the next month. So it is an estimate that's put in there. But because options are trading in the market and In fact, as we mentioned earlier, they were trading in the markets long before these formulas came out. We are actually able to just look at the price that options are trading at, put that into our Black-Scholes formula, and back out implied volatility. So essentially, we're able to see, using this formula in a sort of backwards manner, what traders expect the volatility of that underlying to be over the life of an option that is trading in the market right now. So derivatives traders are usually referred to as volatility traders because they're not necessarily trading the directionality of the underlying. They're not necessarily betting that the underlying will move up or down. You can do that with options, but most professional traders are actually buying and selling options based on whether they think the volatility, the implied volatility in that option is too high or too low. 
So last week we learned that you, by combining options, you are able to put on trades that you can't normally put on with just trading a stock or trading an underlying. And this week we've now learned that you're actually able to trade the volatility of the underlying by buying and selling options based upon whether you think the, the implied volatility within that options price is too high or too low. Now we're going to learn much more about that in coming weeks, but this is the end of this class and we'll look forward to learning more next week. Bye.